Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm glad you all could make it to this uh, important uh, symposium. Uh, my name is Eric Luna. I'm a law professor here at WNL, and I'm pleased to moderate today's second panel uh, entitled Addressing Complexities of Scale. Um, the panel focuses on the issues related uh, to the scale of climate regulation, um, whether issues like greenhouse gas emissions and their impacts um, should be approached from a multiscalar perspective, one uh, cognizant of the uh, various levels of governance and the practical problems of uniform solutions. Uh, we begin today with Professor Tony Arnold, the uh, Buhl Chair in Property and Land Use, a Professor of Law and Affiliate Professor of Urban Planning at the University of uh, Louisville, an internationally recognized expert in environmental regulation of land use, water, and property, uh, Professor Arnold will uh, discuss the complex and interdependent relationship between land use and climate change. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Tony Arnold. Thank you. Uh, well, like uh, Stephanie in the uh, earlier panel, I, um, I, I agree that the local role in both in climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation is uh, important. Um, However, I also think that federal climate change policies will necessarily involve land use policies and practices in the U.S. Um, and let me give you four uh, quick examples. Uh, first, um, spatial distribution of development, uh, basically sprawl, uh, directly contributes to vehicle miles traveled, uh, which uh, in turn is a significant component of the uh, approximately 33% uh, share of our greenhouse gas emissions that are due to the transportation sector. Um, secondly, structures. Um, the uh, estimates put the uh, impact of buildings and similar structures at uh, roughly 40 percent of the contribution to greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, and, um, and so we're going to be concerned about the, the um, energy consumption nature of, of structures in the United States. Um, green infrastructure uh, provides a, uh, the, basically the, the um, uh, trees and uh, um, open space and so forth of our local landscapes uh, sequester carbon um, and they help us to adapt to the impacts of climate change such as uh, increased runoff uh, from uh, more severe storm events and so forth. Um, uh, and also uh, uh, moderate temperatures uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then uh, uh, finally, uh, some of the water-related impacts of climate change will uh, most definitely affect uh, where growth happens, the amount of growth, the pace of growth uh, in terms of water supply, uh, but also in terms of runoff and the amount of impervious cover and so forth. Uh, so I do think that the, the federal government will be dealing with uh, land use and climate change and the relationship, and the temptation will be to adopt a unidimensional policy, to focus on just a single aspect uh, or uh, uh, characteristic of the problem, uh, focus on one level of geographic scale or jurisdictional scale, uh, use a single institution or single policy instrument or method, uh, treat uh, these issues in fragmented or disconnected ways, or to uh, uh, adopt a model or a template uh, uh, that uh, doesn't match the complex, dynamic, and uncertain nature of the phenomenon. And, and I think that we see the Obama administration being uh, more um, uh, sort of multi-dimensional, at least in terms of what has been, um, uh, you know, what, what was on the campaign's uh, websites and the policy platforms and so forth, uh, but the temptation will be great uh, for a unidimensional approach for a variety of reasons, psychological uh, phenomena related to framing, uh, cognitive capacity, heuristics and optimism biases, uh, socio-structural uh, phenomena related to specialization, uh, organizational and institutional isomorphism, uh, uh, path dependency, uh, cultural norms and the growth imperative, and also for political reasons, for, uh, in, uh, because of interest group capture, the benefits of symbolic policy, uh, the modes of political communication, basically our soundbite uh, 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 political culture, um, and the what would are called wicked policy problems, which is really the inability to to disconnect or disaggregate uh, decisions about values and goals from decisions about means and methods. 
Um, but interdimensional policies have a high potential uh, or high risk of failure. Uh, and let me give you uh, uh, some examples. Uh, we see a lot of proposals about climate change policies focused on energy e efficiency and alternative energy sources for both vehicles and uh, structures. These policies could have the perverse effect of actually stimulating more sprawl because uh, people feel like with their uh, it, uh, energy uh, efficient uh, McMansions that they can sprawl out all over everywhere driving their hybrid vehicles. Right? And so uh, a disconnect there. Uh, we could, um, alternatively, we see a number of policies promoting compact, dense, transit-oriented infill development in the metro core. Uh, but that actually could end up pushing development to parts of the metropolitan core that are in expanding floodplains as um, climate change uh, um, uh, has a, in, impacts on floodplains in our urban areas, and also um, in patterns that impede quick evacuation in the case of floods and hurricanes and so forth. We could combine. Uh, policies to uh, reduce vehicle miles traveled and reduce energy consumption with both compact uh, dense infill development and uh, green buildings, um, energy efficient buildings. But um, this, these, um, there are several ways in which these might conflict with uh, green infrastructure policies uh, related to urban tree canopy. Uh, open space, swales and bioretention for runoff, urban natural areas to connect children to nature, and so forth. Um, we get focused on one thing and we ignore the other. Um, and then finally, strong detailed federal policies on climate change and land use could squelch or even preempt local initiatives and momentum and, to, uh, and limit uh, broad uh, public participation in uh, these mitigation and adaptation uh, measures at local and regional levels, including uh, participation by low-income and minority neighborhoods, considerably uh, less uh, 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 easy to do it at broad national scales. Uh, so we have really what, what I say is a multi-dimensional relationship between climate and land use and between climate change policies and land use practices and policies characterized by um, multiple, diverse, interdependent, complex, dynamic, and uncertain relationships. Um, and, and so and I'll call your attention to the, the color handout that, uh, that was sent, I think sent by email and also provided on the, on the table, um, because I'm not going to go through all this, but what I tried to do in the handout is to show that there are geographic dimensions, temporal dimensions, resource dimensions, conceptual dimensions, organizational and sectoral dimensions and process dimensions to these problems, to these relationships that are interconnected. And so what I'm suggesting is, um, is kind of multi-scalar plus. Uh, Hari's work on, on um, the multi-scalar analysis of climate change is incredibly important and significant. Um, and at the same time, I think that we need to think beyond just uh, geographic scale to the multiple dimensions in which the way these connect. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to suggest in terms of federal climate change land use policy is a focus on institutional capacity and functioning, that the policy should facilitate and achieve resilient, dynamic, adaptive, well-functioning, integrative, multidimensional methods of mitigating and adapting to climate change by improving the capacity of institutions involved in land use decisions to address climate change. Um, I have 10 um, elements of that, uh, which I probably really can't do in the time uh, frame that we have. Uh, but let me, let me try to, to highlight uh, a few of them. Um, first of all, I think that um, federal policy could do a lot to improve information about the relationships between climate and land use uh, and their uses. I, um, one of the things I think we need to be thinking about is um, could the federal government require local and state governments to engage in environmental impact analysis in environmental decisions, um, or uh, perhaps this emerging health impact assessments uh, that are uh, now uh, increasingly available in connection with uh, Centers for Disease Control and uh, the American Planning Association, um, and perhaps also subsidize such analysis to improve and increase the information that's available and in its use. Um, funding um, 
um, transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research in facilitating feedback loops in land use decisions. Another is to facilitate and use multi-scalar institutions and networks that operate at variable scales. Um, in particular, federal legislation might provide express authority for interjurisdictional action and interjurisdictional cost sharing and revenue sharing at broad uh, regional levels of a variety of types. Uh, what we see um, as, you, as we look at land use law across the nation is there's enormous variation as far as how much uh, authority localities have to engage in interjurisdictional uh, kinds of cooperative efforts. Um, planning at the watershed uh, level uh, might make some sense. Not all of the relationships between climate change and land use have a hydrologic dimension, but watershed uh, levels offer some, some um, benefits. First of all, we have existing progress in watershed planning and the development of watershed-based institutions. Uh, the, the, um, planning at this level is fairly adaptive and it's oriented towards ecological realities rather than merely, merely uh, sort of arbitrary political jurisdictional <coughs> boundaries. Um, watershed scales are nested and variable, so you could have smaller planning units in catchment uh, uh, levels and, and sub-watershed levels as part of broader uh, uh, watershed and basin level uh, uh, planning um, and to look beyond the hydrologic dimensions but at a variety of, of dimensions. Um, and it can be place-based, uh, participatory, and experiential as many of the points that Stephanie made. Um, in addition, our typical regional planning efforts, uh, um, <coughs> metropolitan planning organizations, MPOs, uh, that are mostly designed to uh, make plans about funding of transportation infrastructure are not working. They're, they are not working to uh, deal with the complex, multifaceted nature, and so they either need to expand substantially their mission expertise uh, planning processes, participatory processes, or get out of the way and, and coordinate with other kinds of regional planning efforts. Um, very, just very briefly, the, I think we need to be thinking about um, integrated uh, resource uh, management, uh, not separate and fragmented, but also not synthesized. Not, we don't need to create some sort of indistinguishable whole. Uh, we need to be linking climate change policies to diverse other areas of <coughs> land use and environmental policies such as public health impl implications, children and nature, uh, smart growth policies, the local food movement, uh, land conservation policies, uh, water planning and water quality uh, concerns, environmental justice, and so forth. Um, and. Um, and then uh, I guess the final point that I'm going to mention, because again I'm only covering about half of what I have here to, to, to talk about in terms of, of uh, recommendations, uh, but I also think that federal policy might stimulate a focus on implementation and enforcement methods. One of our problems in uh, land use is that we uh, adopt a, a wide variety of very admirable plans and policies that do not actually get implemented in the day-to-day -day permit decisions um, and uh, uh, decisions about zoning changes and development projects uh, and uh, the actual public infrastructure funding. Um, and and uh, even if the policies get uh, implemented through the permitting process, there's an enormous potential non-compliance problem. We do not have the same kind of strong enforcement of uh, requirements in the land use area as we see in, um, um, in federal and state environmental law. Um, and so that's another area where federal policy might be able to lead to help give the localities uh, some uh, you know, some incentives to put some more teeth into to their policies. Uh, okay, well, I'll stop here, and, and maybe we can talk more about some of the other aspects later. Our second speaker is Harry Asofsky, uh, professor of law here at Washington University School of Law.
um, a scholarly pioneer in the intersection between climate change law and geography. Uh, Professor Osofsky will discuss diagonal climate regulation today. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Hari Osofsky. Thank you, Eric. And before I start, I have an announcement to make unrelated to my talk, which is um, for conference participants, so students, presenters, moderators, um, uh, they want to do a picture of us um, immediately following this panel. So please uh, sort of don't get moving to lunch too quickly. Um, so it's a tremendous an honor and a pleasure, as I said in my, my first remarks this morning, to be able to be part of this conversation. And I'm so glad to have all of you here, whether in person or virtually. Um, it's, and it's particularly fun to be on this panel with, um, with folks who bring an, an ecological perspective um, and, um, and who are all really grappling with these issues of scale in their work. Um, as Tony mentioned, um, my current work is focusing on the scale of climate regulation. In particular, what I mean by that is that climate change is what I would term a multi-scalar regulatory problem. Um, governmental entities at every level, from the most local to the most international, make decisions relevant to emissions regulation and to impacts and adaptation. This character of climate change poses substantial challenges for the negotiation and implementation of a post-Kyoto international agreement that includes the United States and for new efforts at federal regulation. My current research attempts to address these issues of scale by exploring possible models for what I term diagonal regulation and how they might apply to the Obama administration's efforts to address climate change. Um, and in that sense, I think it'll complement the, the, the talk that, that Tony just gave um, and his focus on institutional capacity and function. By diagonal regulation, I mean approaches that simultaneously cut across levels of government, the vertical, and involve many different entities at each level of government, the horizontal. For example, when several US states collaborate with the European Union on a climate initiative, that would constitute a diagonal effort. However, a coalition of cities working on climate change is merely horizontal, and a mandate from the EPA to a state um, would be merely vertical. In my 10 minutes, what I'm going to try to do is just introduce the regulatory architecture I'm developing, and I'll look forward to getting more into the nuances of application in our discussion. So that's sort of my compromise for that. So what I'm going to do is, is talk briefly about what I think fully integrated re diagonal regulation would look like and then talk a little bit about, about some of my current thinking on partial diagonal regulatory strategies. So fully integrated diagonal regulation involves interaction across levels of government with multiple actors at each level, a relevant level involved. So for example, as part of its implementation of the Supreme Court's decision in Massachusetts v. EPA, the US EPA might work with other agencies, Congress, and state and local environmental regulators to create a comprehensive approach to transportation emissions that involves mandates from the federal government that would be implemented at multiple scales and could be reshaped at designated intervals through input from state and local government, as well as a petition process through which governmental entities, non-governmental entities, and individuals could express dissent. By incorporating a wide range of actors at different levels, fully integrated diagonal regulation creates coalitions and opportunities for dissent that begin to reflect the regulatory landscape of the problem. However, that very mirroring makes creating such schemes very difficult, right? Bringing together so many actors is not only difficult to agree upon, but it poses significant implementation challenges. These approaches require buy-in and cooperation of many regulatory entities, as well as agreement for structuring these mechanisms for input and disagreement. Such synchronization can be daunting. Um, and you'll see I've changed my graphics since last week, Rebecca, in, in answer to your vectors. Um, the complexities of creating fully integrated diagonal regulation suggest the value of creating partially integrated regulatory approaches, which in tandem might create a more integrated overall model. And to explore what diagonal regulatory strategies might entail, I want to discuss four vectors along which partial integration might occur. Regulatory scale, regulatory access, regulatory hierarchy, and regulatory cooperativeness. So predominantly large and predominantly small scale approaches maintain some of the advantages of fully integrated di diagonal regulation without its level of complexity. The large scale version would involve regulatory arrangements dominated by international or national actors, whereas the small scale ones would focus on subnational actors. 
Predominantly large-scale regulation not only has the advantage of greater simplicity than fully integrated approaches, but such strategies would also be more likely to satisfy those who view that level of regulation as appropriate and as a result might face less opposition. Moreover, they could be integrated easily into the Obama administration's announced plans regarding climate change, many of which focus on the federal or international scale. At the other end of the scale spectrum, because a large number of U.S. states and cities have been well ahead of federal regulatory efforts, especially during the Bush administration, significant uh, possibilities exist for diagonal regulation that includes them and is driven by them. But the existence of active small-scale governmental initiatives, however, I think also poses a challenge for the Obama administration. Um, As the administration augments national and international efforts, questions will consistently arise about whether these new developments should preempt state and local policy. Although thus far the Obama administration appears to recognize the value in supporting ongoing efforts, the president's speech when announcing that he's directed the EPA to reconsider California's Clean Air Act waiver certainly had language to that effect. How the administration will incorporate these initiatives into legislation and treaty negotiation remains to be seen. Unless the administration consciously makes efforts to to connect collaborative efforts among cities, counties, and states into its larger scale efforts, additional opportunities for predominantly small scale diagonal regulation may be lost. Now, like the predominantly small or large scale approaches, predominantly horizontal or vertical diagonal strategies provide opportunities for interconnection that might be easier to achieve than full integration. Predominantly horizontal regulation primarily involves collaboration within one or more levels, whereas predominantly vertical regulation focuses on interaction among levels and has more minimal activity in any particular level. So predominantly horizontal efforts tend to arise out of a group of entities operating at a particular level that then form a larger scale coalition. The primary advantage of predominantly horizontal regulation is that it builds out of governance commonalities at a particular level of government. They can take advantage of existing coalitions of entities at one governmental level and then build a vertical dimension into these collaborations. The primary advantage of predominantly vertical regulation is similar to that of predominantly horizontal ones. Namely, these efforts can arise out of naturally occurring regulatory arrangements. The US federalist system of government provides many patterns that climate regulation could follow. However, in both cases, the ease of creation is offset by the limited interaction they entail along the other axis. The Obama administration could fairly easily integrate predominantly horizontal or predominantly vertical approaches into its regulatory schemes, but should make sure to have some of each to create more overall scalar interaction, to create that overall diagonal effect. Because any diagonal scheme will include different levels of government, questions of hierarchy arise. Predominantly top-down approaches involve dictates from larger scale entities to smaller scale entities, whereas predominantly bottom-up ones are driven by subnational ones. Top-down approaches have the benefit of avoiding divergence at smaller scales and much discussed concern of bottom-up approaches. In so doing, they prevent piecemeal strategies that can cause leakage, a concern that our earlier speaker Jonathan Weiner has raised consistently, and set clear expectations for corporations and others that have interests which cross-cut jurisdictions. Also, as with large-scale efforts, top-down approaches comport with traditional expectations about how a complex problem like climate change should be regulated. Conversely, top-down approaches, unless carefully structured, risk stifling the innovation and local knowledge that localities and states can provide we were just hearing about. Bottom-up efforts can capture more easily the many divergences that are needed for smaller-scale actors to respond to local conditions without the rigidity and constraint that often accompanies top-down mandates. Now, either top-down or bottom-up efforts, if carefully structured, could avoid these pitfalls. So top-down mandates can can include adequate flexibility to allow for smaller-scale innovation and tailoring, and bottom-up efforts can coordinate sufficiently to address many of the critiques. Moreover, tandem top-down and bottom-up approaches, to which the Obama administration's simultaneous efforts on fuel standards and the Clean Air Act waiver suggest an openness, could incorporate the benefits of both. The key either way is an awareness of these benefits and limitations so that they can be maximized, well, the benefits can be maximized, the limitations can be minimized in an overall regulatory scheme. Finally, last but not least, diagonal regulatory strategies are not necessarily cooperative. 
My preceding work traces the way in which lawsuits over climate regulation, for example, serve as forces of diagonal integration, part of the skepticism I was, um, I was, I was expressing to Professor Rule's um, sort of limitation on, on litigation. Like with other vectors, cooperativeness serves as just one factor in a regulatory scheme, and it may in fact vary at different stages. Cooperative federalism's greatest advantage in this context is its ability to create coordinated, agreed-upon, multi-scalar action in which each actor provides a unique contribution. The various cooperative models being tossed about at the moment, however, pose two major difficulties. First, conflict exists. Cooperative schemes may struggle at times to address difference adequately and include all relevant actors. Second, and at least as importantly, conflict has value. Regulatory schemes that provide opportunity for dissent, such as through litigation, can potentially incorporate divergent views more effectively, as well as make sure that pressure remains on policymakers to think through tough issues. And I think that's something that's important even with an administration that shows a greater commitment to these issues of climate change. Given the limitations on cooperative models, the Obama administration will likely need a mix of cooperative, cooperation and conflict in, in any sort of effective multiscalar scheme that it's trying to create. Overall, then, an integrated diagonal strategy could be developed not only through fully integrated approaches, but through a combination of approaches that have partial integration across, along all four vectors. The key to creating the needed cross-cutting interactions is to ensure that incentives for both vertical and horizontal interaction occur. Major challenges face any formulation of a post-Kyoto regime and the United States' role within it, as well as efforts to, to construct a comprehensive federal regulatory regime on climate change and energy. My hope is that as the Obama administration navigates this is, these issues, it recognizes the multiscalar dimensions of the regulatory challenges and makes efforts to explore possibilities for diagonals. Such approaches will not solve the problem of climate change and the daunting regulatory challenges it poses for a mix of concerned public and private actors, but they will help the emerging law better fit the scale of the challenges. And with that, I look forward to this. Our next speaker is Professor uh, Nathan Sayer, a professor of uh, geography at the University of California at Berkeley. His research interests focus on the interactions of climate, vegetation, and management from a multidisciplinary perspective. And today he will discuss climate change, scale, and devaluation, the challenge of our built environment. Please help me welcome Professor Nathan Sayer. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Professor Osofsky in particular for her invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I am not a law professor. I don't know very much about law other than the Endangered Species Act as it affects efforts to restore fire in the Southwest, which is very complicated but does not get directly to this issue. Um, I've been interested in climate change for quite some time, and I do think there are some interesting ways in which scale can help us think about this. And my remarks today are aimed uh, primarily at sort of reef framing this discussion. I see the present moment as representing an enormous opportunity, not only because of the new administration, but also because of the global economic crisis that we're in right now. I think it's a, it's a moment at which it makes a lot of sense to really step back and think about the overall frame of this problem. And with a greater familiarity in the uh, climate science than in the law, I'm going to offer some thoughts. I asked that this article by Wally Broker be distributed, and if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to get a copy. It's called CO2 Arithmetic, and it came out in science two years ago. Um, I would encourage you to read the first two paragraphs and then stop. <laughs> in this article, he writes in the very first sentence, he says, if we are ever to succeed in capping the buildup of the atmosphere's CO2 content, we must make a first order change in the way we view the problem. I think he's right. He says the goal must be not merely to reduce the rate of buildup, but to stabilize concentrations as a whole. To do this at twice pre-industrial levels of CO2, considered by many scientists to be a dangerous, uh, but nonetheless feasible and lower than projected for 2100 level, he says we must formulate policy on the premise that humanity as a whole can only emit about 720 gigatons of additional carbon, and then we have to stop. And that was two years ago. That carbon pie of 720 gigatons has already shrunk to about 696 gigatons 
if you look at the most recent numbers, because CO2 concentrations are now at 386 instead of 380, which is where they were when Broker wrote his argument. He goes on to argue for capturing CO2 directly from the atmosphere, a strategy he develops at greater length and somewhat persuasively in his ghost-written autobiography of last year called Fixing Climate. And it's an interesting um, sort of optimistic discussion of how we can capture CO2 directly at millions of dispersed sites and then uh, probably deposit the resulting carbon in the bottom of the ocean. I wouldn't argue against developing air capture technologies, but neither would I rely on them. I fear that Broker's technological optimism distracts us from making the first order change in the way we view the problem that he urges in his opening sentence. Thinking of climate change as a matter of absolute limits on rather than relative rates of CO2 emissions is indeed what we have to do. Capture technologies, if they can be developed, would relax those limits and expand the pie. This sounds great, but in the meantime, I think we need to absorb more deeply the lessons of CO2 arithmetic. The simplest statement of these lessons would be this. We need to leave as much coal, oil, and gas in the ground as possible for as long as possible. It's as simple as that. To say that this position is politically impossible does not make it any less true. At the very least, it should be the point of departure for all negotiations and debates. Anything less is already a potentially fateful concession. If we're going to have an honest negotiation about this, we need to state one position up front very clearly. To understand why, it helps to consider climate change through the lens of scale. Scientists talk about scale in terms not just of whether you're dealing with a smaller or larger entity, but the grain or resolution at which you examine it and the extent over which you are gathering or examining those grains or resolution. Spatially, the grain of the process of climate change is microscopically small, individually, individual molecules of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. They are invisible to the naked eye and produced in myriad ways, whether we are breathing, turning over a spade of soil, whether a plant is decaying, a cow is ruminating, or whether we are burning wood or coal or gas or oil. Meanwhile, the extent is global. All those molecules join the Earth's atmosphere. I imagine most of you are familiar with this and quickly mix together, becoming equal parts of the whole process that gradually warms the planet. Over time, some are absorbed by plants, some by oceans, some by the soil, and some eventually degrade or break down, but it matters not a whit where or from what they were earlier emitted. The impacts of global warming are not homogeneous in space, nor are the emissions evenly distributed, but the process is indifferent to such geographical specifics. Temporally, the grain is likewise infinitesimal that split second at which a chemical reaction occurs. And the extent is likewise huge. Looking forward, it extends, for CO2 at least, centuries. Looking back, it reaches as long as the process by which it was earlier sequestered. Decades or centuries for trees, hundreds of millions of years for coal, gas, or oil. Whatever the amount of CO2 emitted in excess of the amount reabsorbed during a given period of time is out there for good for all practical purposes. I think the difficulties of confronting global warming are a function of these unique scalar qualities. Such extreme disparities between spatial and temporal grain and extent are exceptional among environmental processes of, of any direct significance to humans. I've thought about this a lot, and I can't come up with a single example where something that actually matters for us has these scalar characteristics. We can barely think at these scales. And I think the importance of Broker's arithmetic lies in the enormous difference of temporal scale between fossil fuels and other sources of atmospheric CO2. Roughly six orders of magnitude. Here you get a picture. This is to try to give you a sense of, you know, we're talking 300 to 360 million years ago that the carbon in coal and oil and gas, generally speaking, um, was removed from the atmosphere and sequestered. And we are putting it back out there every time we burn these fuels. Um, it also happens that it was at a time when, you know, the arrangement of the continents on the face of the earth was radically different. And this en enabled it to be possible. This is a depiction of the process. In other words, the carbon released by a forest fire was sequestered mere decades or centuries ago. For fossil fuels, it happened hundreds of millions of years ago. To be sure, then, Deforestation contributes to the problem in a significant way. 
But careful study of the Keeling curve should make it clear that preventing deforestation or even planting new forests cannot suffice to address the problem of climate change. So um, here we can actually, this one, the, the black line is a smooth average. The red line are the actual monthly readings of CO2 concentrations, and they're going up and down, and everyone knows why, right? Because all the vegetation on the face of the earth is, during one season, in a net sense, growing and absorbing CO2, and in another season is uh, not growing and is releasing CO2. And if you look at the longer term graph, it does the same thing, um, but that gives you a sense of the potential for the world's vegetation to tackle this problem. And yes, it can make a difference, but no, it can't possibly make a difference on the scale that we need between um, say the changes, the, the levels in, at 1800, pre-industrial levels, and what we're looking at now. This, I think, is, the, is why Broker reaches the conclusions he does, but he doesn't spend any time laying out the argument. Instead, he gets excited about air capture. In other words, carbon offset and create credit trading schemes that fail to account for these scale differences are destined to fail, at least if we look more than 10 or 100 years down the road, as we must. And this is independently of all the other problems that they face in terms of whether they actually sequester carbon. So, sorry to sound dismal, but from a more practical standpoint, the focus of climate change policy should fall unequivocally on what geographers call the built environment. By this is meant the durable, human-produced structures and systems in and through which societies produce goods and services and thereby reproduce themselves. And this is a very broad category. It includes buildings, roads, harbors and airports, energy and communication systems, water and sewage facilities, factories and schools and hospitals. It includes the kinds of practices we employ in agriculture, the things we grow and how we grow them. Whether built and owned by governments or private firms, the components of the built environment have a number of things in common. First, they tend to be very expensive to build. Second, they therefore depend on financial instruments and institutions that permit or require long-term planning and amortization. I just looked up this morning the uh, total level of municipal bonding debt in this country amounts to $9,970 per person, or a total of nearly $3 trillion, and that's just municipal bonding. From this it follows, third, that they must persist these elements of the built environment, not just physically but economically, far into the future so that the bonds or other instruments used to pay for them can be successfully redeemed. Finally, fourth, the built environment is not only a very complex and expensive investment, it is also the world in which people live, profoundly shaping our habits of thought and behavior. It is naturalized as the taken for granted and normal. It, geographers would argue, produces the space times of our lives. The challenge of our built environment is manifold. In almost every aspect, its construction entailed large greenhouse gas emissions itself. Its maintenance entails more such emissions. And because it was generally built under conditions of cheap energy, and I'm talking about the US here, its continued use generally commits us to still more emissions going forward. Yet we cannot easily write it off and start over. We can't write off the debt. We can't necessarily tear down these systems and replace them. We might not have the money. This predicament holds, I would argue, at every scale, from households to, and small businesses and municipalities up to national governments and transnational firms. No one wants their durable assets, whether they are SUVs or container ships, devalued by regulatory or legal mechanisms. And I don't blame them. There is a twist, though, and I think it constitutes a political opportunity that the Obama administration ought to take advantage of. Directly or indirectly, Global warming is going to devalue our built environment anyway. It's not a question of whether, but merely of when and how it will happen. Hurricanes, Katrina, nice, abrupt, radical, terrifying, dis or horrible experience, but is an example of this. Rising sea levels, droughts, retreating glaciers. California can't pay to rebuild its water system bringing water from the Sierra Nevada, but if the snowpack is gone, what choice are we going to have? Heat waves, retrofitting houses, shift, shifting conditions for various crops. I mean, the costs associated with this 
with this are going to be extraordinary. The Stern report does a nice job of laying this out. We cannot know how soon or how abruptly devaluation by climate change will take place for any given location, but it is clear that we should expect it to happen on a time scale of decades, not centuries, which is to say it's beginning to be the same time scale at which decisions about financing, bonding, amortization, long-term investment for private firms, that kind of thing, ought to be undertaken. I think the policy implications of this are, are very far-reaching. If we assume that 2 to 5 percent of annual reinvestment in our built environment is a normal necessity, then it, in a 20 to 50 year time period, we can expect essentially to turn over our entire built environment. We may not replace every element of it, but from a financial economic point of view, it is turning over. This may or may not be fast enough relative to climate change impacts, but it'll, it is a logic that everyone should be able to understand, even the people who say, no, these changes are going to cost too much. If every single decision we make regarding the built environment from this point forward is made with climate change as a high priority, we may well be able to anticipate, absorb, and in many ways control the processes of devaluation that are in store for us. Framed this way, I think, there is little dis clear, though, there's almost no distinction between mitigation and adaptation. A built environment that produces fewer greenhouse gas emissions is often also more resistant to rising temperatures, diminishing water supplies, and declining fossil energy inputs. I think that's my last slide. Um, I guess I would close with an idea that came to me, well, it's been kicking around, and it, it came back to me this, this morning, listening to some of the other, other pi panelists. Um, as far as getting people's attention and taking advantage of the opportunity, the sort of political moment that we are facing, um, I would suggest something along these lines. Uh, I personally think a carbon tax is a necessity. Um, cap and trade has got advantages too, but I think a carbon tax is a necessity. I would propose something along the to get people's attention, eliminate the income tax and replace it with a carbon tax. That will make people notice. Thank you. Our final speaker today is, for this panel, is uh, David Worth, Professor of Law at Boston College Law School, College of Law. Um, the author of more than five dozen books, uh, articles and reports on international environmental law and policy for both legal and popular audiences, uh, Professor Worth will discuss the meshing of domestic and international initiatives. Please help me welcome Professor David Worth. Actually, I wouldn't ordinarily do this, but I would like to add one very important piece to my bio, namely that I am a former and very proud member of this faculty. In fact, if you look at my tie, you will see a very discreet representation of the colonnade on the, on the front campus. Um, uh, listening to the previous presentation as well as that of Professor Craig's reminded me that I was uh, originally trained as a chemist, and I was forced to spend an entire semester doing what in the business are called carbonate equilibrium. We would do fascinating experiments like take the pH of the Indian Ocean over and over and over again. Um, as a result, however, I know in excruciating detail exactly how carbon is sequestered in the oceans, and I will be glad to explain that uh, with almost no provocation whatsoever. Uh, as my 15-year-old son, who is a student of chemistry in high school, discovered when we went out to dinner together, I was writing on the back of a cocktail napkin. The waitress thought that this was very strange. And I think the moral of the story is that when your dad's an academic, this is about as close as you get to kicking up your heels together. <laughs> but uh, uh, as a result, the term scientific method in our household has a bad name. Um, fortunately, I'll spare you that today. Uh, and I'd like to speak about a, a different issue, namely meshing the international multilateral negotiations with the domestic uh, statutory initiatives. Um, I'm not sure whether this qualifies as diagonal or not. Professor Osofsky can uh, clarify that later on. Uh, it appears to be fairly technical, but in fact it's a very important issue in real life. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, give you a sense of the urgency of this situation. Second of all, a uh, sense of the structural impediments that are built into our constitutional structure. <laughs> Third, uh, prior practice, and to what extent that may or may not be helpful, and last, to make three suggestions for the Obama administration. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, where we are at the moment, uh, 
Um, I went to a conference in Washington last fall uh, at which a staff member of the House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming was speaking. I asked her whether uh, the EU's proposal, I think it was mentioned earlier today, uh, to move from 20% to 30% reductions uh, by the year 2020 if other industrialized countries would go along. I asked whether that had gotten much traction in the Congress. Her, action wa her response was, not at all, because not a single member of Congress knows about it. And then I asked, well, how are these initiatives going to be dovetailed? And she very optimistically referred to uh, something called the Texas Two-Step and left it at that. Uh, so that's where the House Select Committee on Global Warming is. Um, I went to another presentation in the fall, uh, sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations, where there was a representative of the uh, European Union mission delegation in Washington. It's like an embassy. Um, he was asked about the boxer Lieberman Warner uh, uh, proposal, which at the time was the principal uh, legislative vehicle, he responded that, quote, it was a good start. I went up to him afterwards and I said, well, you better realize that the start and the finish may be the same thing because we're not necessarily going to have two bites at this apple. Um, Congressman Markey uh, his, and his Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming says that we have, as of the beginning of February, we have exactly 305 days left until Copenhagen, and you have to shave off 14 since that was published on February 5th. Uh, the next meeting of the multilateral negotiations is going to be held in Bonn, Germany in March, at which time the uh, Obama administration will be forced to unveil a proposal for these negotiations. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, what I'd like to do then is to give you some sense of the structural impediments to getting to Copenhagen as well as getting to the end of the pipe, if you will, with legislative initiatives. Um, <clears throat> I have to admit before I start on this that the last history course I took was when I was in high school. Uh, but I do remember a, a rather unfortunate uh, uh, patch in the history of the United States rarely discussed <laughs> in history courses called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, as a result, the framers of the Constitution, it's well known, adopted an instrument, the Constitution that we live under now, with a strong president. Um, Article 2 of the Constitution sets out the president as not only the commander in chief and a variety of performing a variety of other functions, basically the CEO of the government, but also, and for these purposes, most importantly, our diplomat in chief. Um, as a result, the president and the executive branch have a monopoly and exclusive prerogative on representing the, the country abroad. Well, how does the United States go about making uh, international agreements? You already know this from your third grade civics class. The president goes out and negotiates an agreement, brings it home, and then presents it to the Senate for its advice and consent uh, to ratification. By the way, to initiate you into the priesthood of people that really understand this stuff, uh, the Senate does not ratify treaties. The president ratifies <coughs> treaties, it's a political act, and the Senate gives its advice and consent as a condition precedent. Um, then, the, after having given its advice and consent, the president then can ratify the agreement. Important points here is that are that, first of all, that the Senate cannot reach out and grab an agreement. It's in, in a passive role after having had the agreement presented to it. Um, and the theory of the, uh, of the Senate resolution of advice and consent, uh, which, by the way, is the only one house resolution that I know of in the Constitution that has legal effect, is to give domestic legitimate, political legitimacy as well as legal effect to an agreement. Framers saw fit to establish a very high bar, uh, namely a two-thirds supermajority. Uh, and if you remember your history, even I remember this, the Senate uh, at that time was not directly elected, but it was <coughs> chosen by the states. So the idea, see, the usual interpretation is that this was an, a vehicle for bringing in the states. Now, the result of all of this is that uh, by comparison with a parliamentary democracy such as the UK, where the uh, executive is a subset of the legislature, uh, we have a system that is very much biased towards caution, that, is very, that has a lot of inertia towards refraining from engaging in international commitments as the default option because of this separation of powers and the, uh, high, the, uh, the high hurdle to get through the Senate. 
It also creates an interesting dynamic, getting back to the staffers, uh, Texas two-step, that the president, of course, has the power to do almost anything he wants in an international <coughs> but he would be poorly advised to negotiate something that wouldn't get through the Senate. So there's a dynamic that I call the raised eyebrow, where uh, the, uh, the Congress, and particularly the Senate, plays an important role, shadow role, de facto, behind the scenes in shaping and molding these international agreements. What does that mean for climate? Uh, as probably everyone in this room knows, the Kyoto Protocol was originally planned to be done as a treaty and to be submitted to the Senate for its advice and consent. Um, a number of months before the international meeting and the, the uh, conference of the parties in Kyoto that adopted the Kyoto Protocol, a resolution was adopted by the U.S. Senate, 95 to 0, uh, strongly suggesting that uh, the Senate would refrain from giving its advice and consent to an agreement that was, first of all, too expensive and second of all, that didn't involve developing countries. I mean, that shows the difficulty of getting an agreement through the Senate. Um, ultimately, the Clinton administration signed the agreement, did not submit it to the Senate, and then, as probably everybody in this room knows, in March of 2001, uh, President Bush indicated his intention to refrain from ratifying the agreement ever. Now, I would suggest to you that this is a dysfunctional scenario that we do not want to repeat. Um, and for better or worse, we now have a situation that has dramatically changed. For the past eight years, as one of the previous speakers pointed out, we've had a passive president, our diplomat, our eyes and ears to the outside world and from the outside world, uh, has basically done nothing. Um, Meanwhile, no pun intended, things are heating up in Congress. Thing, it looks a lot more attractive than the 95 to 0 Bert Hagel resolution. And the multilateral negotiations are moving forward. Lots of activity at the state and municipal level as well. But for our purposes, it's these parallel tracks with a, a passive fulcrum in the middle, if you will, uh, that characterizes the current situation. My concern is that there is a risk that the legislation will be um, a least common denominator dra downward drag, that is U.S. legislation on the multilateral negotiations, no matter, how, um, no matter how aggressive we try to be. If it doesn't allow the executive to come up with uh, creative and aggressive commitments in the multilateral negotiation, uh, I think we'll pay the price for that at the end. Uh, this is particularly important because if you think about it, this is a negotiation. Uh, you don't get anything that you don't ask for in advance, and usually the approach is to layer some additional, uh, some additional concessions on that can be traded away in the end. Uh, so my concern is that the legislation could in fact hobble the multilateral negotiations as opposed to enable them and push them forward. And this is particularly true for the targets for 2020. Uh, which have received relatively little attention in this country for the relatively obvious reason that we're going to have a very difficult time meeting any sort of commitment for the year 2020. Um, just a sense of past practice and then uh, my three suggestions. Um, this is something of an overgeneralization, but the past practice of the United States in the international environmental area has generally tend tended to be to legislate first and then to engage in multilateral cooperation as opposed to the opposite. Uh, a very good example is acid rain. Um, the Clean Air Act for 13 years languished awaiting, uh, awaiting reauthorization in 1990. Um, the, the, well, first of all, to back up a little bit, the issue of acid rain is both a domestic issue and an international issue. Uh, concern is about emissions coming from the Midwest harming A, New England states, or B, Canada. One is a domestic issue, the other is international. Um, it wasn't until the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments were adopted that involved a cap-and-trade system um, that the United States a year later concluded an air quality agreement with Canada. Now, I actually do a little exercise with my students in which we look at that air quality agreement. It was done a year after the U.S. legislation, and it was done as what's called an executive agreement, meaning that it didn't require additional statutory authority. And I always say, are there any Canadians in the group because your blood should be boiling? Um, this clearly shows that the, that the driver in this case was the domestic legislation and not the international obligations that the United States might owe to Canada. In fact, one of my former colleagues at the State Department said, uh, 
Well, well, it was a good agreement because we got some things out of the Canadians. <laughs> when the general understanding is the United States owed some things to the Canadians as opposed to the other way around. Um, we do have some counterexamples, stratospheric <coughs> ozone being one, in which the United States actually uh, in uh, affirmatively engaged in the multilateral negotiations as if they were a domestic legislative or regulatory process, but they're few and far between. Um, my suggestion is that if we go this route um, in the current situation, we are going to have serious problems. And so I have three suggestions for the Obama administration looking forward. One possibility is to use existing legislation to the extent possible. This is what uh, Professor Rule was talking about in his presentation this morning. Um, in, the, in the situation of acid rain, the legislation was insufficient. It awaited domestic action uh, by Congress. Stratospheric ozone protection was quite different because the um, uh, Environmental Protection Agency already had the legislative authority to be fairly aggressive. Here, we're likely to have a mix. Um, neither one nor the other, but some legislative provisions, some statutory provisions, uh, such as those in the Clean Air Act, are likely to be helpful. The best example is probably Mass v. EPA, which was uh, referred to earlier on. The case in the Supreme Court uh, directing EPA to regulate carbon dioxide emissions from automobiles. Uh, and by the way, in a shameless plug, um, uh, I should point out that I worked on a, a, an amicus brief for um, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in, those, uh, in that case, in which she basically, EPA had come back and said, please, please don't make us regulate carbon dioxide because we want to keep our powder dry in the multilateral negotiations. And Madam Albright said, in the immortal words of one of my former administrative assistants, be real. <laughs> if you disengage from the negotiations, how are you going to implement them? And fortunately, the uh, US Supreme Court accepted that. So domestic statutory initiatives uh, can work here and can give a helpful uh, uh, kick in the pants in the form of momentum. And by the way, they can also create, this goes back to Professor Rule's presentation, they can also create pressure for Congress to adopt more comprehensive <coughs> legislation, to, to come up with something that perhaps makes a little bit more sense and might be cheaper. Second, second option, all the bills in, currently pending in the Congress should explicitly be understood to be implementing legislation for a future agreement. Nobody has said this. In fact, the closest that anybody has come has been Barbara Boxer, Senator Boxer, the chair of Senate Environment and Public Works. At the beginning of this month, she put out a document dealing with principles of global climate change in which she says adjustments to targets and policies as necessary to meet emission reduction targets are required. Translated into ordinary English, that means that we need to have come up with a legislative, uh, a legislative framework that can be adaptable uh, going forward as the negotiations proceed and also uh, there are new scientific developments. Unfortunately, this particular uh, approach does not have the most fortunate history. The uh, best counterexample probably being the Stockholm Convention on um, Persistent Organic Pollutants. Uh, the United States negotiated a specific uh, caveat there that requires when additional, uh, when additional chemicals are added to this, uh, to this agreement that controls chlorinated pesticides, PCBs, uh, DDT, when additional agreements are, when additional chemicals are added, there needs to be a separate ratification uh, process, presumably by our Senate. And the agreement, which has yet to be ratified by the United States, encountered some difficulties in the Senate, precisely for this reason, some senators even questioning the constitutionality of the implementing legislation. The third option is, and I have to say I can't take uh, the slightest bit of um, the, the slightest bit of credit for this, is a proposal called Climate Protection Authority. If you're interested in this, you might see a, a paper by uh, a Brookings staffer named Nigel Purvis uh, that's on the Resources for the Future website. What he does is to analogize this to the trade negotiations. The concern in trade negotiations is that the Senate will pick apart an agreement once it's presented to it by the President. What happens instead is that the two, uh, two houses of the Congress, by simple majority vote, authorize the president to go out and uh, negotiate an agreement and then bring it back. And the, uh, this is the important piece. The House and the Senate both agree to adopt implementing, uh, implementing legislation either by an up or down vote, yes or no, without picking it apart. 
I have to say it's somewhat ironic being here uh, because in this very room 15 years ago when I was a WNL faculty member, I expressed considerable reservations about what was then called fast track. But when you apply it to climate, maybe it uh, strangely makes a little bit more sense. Um, not clear that Congress would, would give the president this sort of authority, um, and although we currently have a president in the Congress of the same party. Just in closing, I'd like to suggest that the Texas two-step is perhaps uh, even more complicated than initially appears. Um, it, it's not clear which branch is going to want more aggressive reductions, and the incentives for both are different. For instance, Congress has to deal with issues like preemption. The executive branch tends to be very jealous, of, I know from personal experience, of its exclusive control over diplomacy. And the issue for us is how to maximize flexibility while structuring uh, domestic legislation so as to encourage uh, aggressive proposals. Uh, some mechanisms are already in place, such as the inclusion of congressional observers on executive branch um, delegations to the multilateral negotiations, but I would suggest that much more coordinated action is required. Um, in any event, this will require unprecedented precision and speed. I was trying to think of a little metaphor here, and this is a generational thing. It will date me immediately. Um, what we need to do is to crank up the, uh, the turntable from, I don't know what this translates to in the iPod here, but what we need to do is to crank up the turntable from 33 RPMs to 78 and uh, get that Texas two-step going real quick. Thank you very much. Thanks to our, um, our presenters, um, very fascinating debate. I uh, would like to open it up to some, some questions both, um, uh, from the audience and maybe from the panelists themselves. Um, and what I'd like to do is begin with a question that I had. Um, and this is the place that might, uh, that might exist um, in this, uh, this scalar issue with regards to private entities, um, including NGOs um, and businesses. Um, and I start thinking about issues uh, that are drawn from what were once called the Chicago School, which I guess is the old Chicago School now of Law and Economics and the new Chicago School of Social Norms, and whether some of the issues with regards to scale can be resolved using uh, non-regulatory approaches, um, concerns about culture and social norms, um, or, or concerns related to the markets, as well as using uh, indirect influences and in regulation uh, zoning on a local level, taxes at the state and federal level, um, and maybe product regulation rather than uh, pollution regulation. So I wanted to throw that out to maybe some of our, um, our experts here uh, and, then, and then see if we can have some questions from the audience. Well, I certainly ag agree with that. Um, and uh, I mean, and I think, I think it's, it's both a positive and a negative, though, because um, what, what you're calling non-regulatory approaches, I think, are part of the scale problem. Um, but have to be part of the scale solution. Um, and I kind of, I actually find legal pluralism to be a very helpful lens through which to think about all of this, um, which is basically a theory that um, sees um, law as a, a set of interacting social and socio-legal spaces, essentially, um, and, that, and that sort of puts together a legal picture that includes both the formal law and the informal law. And I think um, you know, I've, I've talked in, in some of my past work about climate change litigation as pluralist legal dialogue, and I think climate policy it's the same thing, that, that, that you have to recognize the complex dance going on, I think uh, captured very well at David's talk, um, uh, at a policy level, but also as the more ecological presentations say, sort of that, sort of capture that, that complexity as well. And so I think absolutely that that if we that we need to think in creative regulatory terms and not just in sort of the traditional five environmental statutes terms. Yes, I, I totally uh, agree with what Hari just said. I think that's exactly right in terms of, of uh, legal pluralism and, and part of the problem and the solution. Um, I guess two particular things that I think are worth uh, noting. One is uh, certainly when we think about uh, land use and the and the local level is. Uh, a certain degree of risk aversion that would not perhaps be um, consistent with rational economic self-interest. And so there's, there's a sort of a, a, um, uh, a little bit of a skewing of uh, markets and that sort of thing. Um, and so, for example, we find uh, sustainable development opportunities 
that make great economic sense, and yet it because of um, what I, I think one of the problems is is sort of. Uh, uh, organizational or professional isomorphism's tendency to do the same thing the same way and to be reluctant to change. Uh, so I think that's one thing that's going on. I think another thing, this kind of goes to a point that, that Nathan uh, recommended, is I think we need to do more to create public demand and consumer demand for sustainable development uh, generally. Uh, and so one of the things that I don't pretend to know uh, as much about cap and trade and carbon taxes as a, as a lot of other folks, uh, but it does seem to me that if we want to facilitate um, more sustainable, sustainable practices at local and state levels, that a carbon tax really could help create the kind of demand in a, in a way that, um, that could coordinate uh, a number of different uh, sort of environmental goals at, at a local uh, or regional level. Just briefly, on the international level, non-regulatory purchases tend to be tends to be interpreted as nine non-binding guidelines, good practice standards, something like that. Um, the uh, I would suggest that the history of this issue internationally, in which the United States has engaged in up till now in a variety of cooperative efforts that really do fit this, this mold has been perceived largely as a failure to engage. So I think that the his, I spend a lot of time with my students and I teach international environmental law trying to disabuse them of the notion, that, which is a very lawyerly one, that binding hard requirements are always the gold standard. Sometimes non-binding uh, good practice standards can work uh, very well. I would suggest that the culture surrounding this particular issue is you have to have a binding architecture. You have to have a commitment that can be that is understood as a deal and that can be enforced. That having been said, there is lots of opportunity for uh, subsidiary good practice standards and non-binding efforts. But I think we need a a uh, a, uh, a readily comprehensible binding architecture on the international. And I, just a, a follow-up to that, kind of to play the, the, the devil's advocate on the other side. And what, what, I, what I sense in hearing the discussion is that there, um, that there are a variety of levels in which, in which um, these issues have to be addressed. And what immediately comes to mind is, is the notion that, that politics is the art of the possible. And the possible tends not to be what, uh, or, or doesn't necessarily comport with what um, science or what um, what, what uh, be best practices might, um, might entail. They may in involve what is the best economic um, uh, um, uh, pa package for a particular uh, district or, 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 um, uh, or state. And it raises, in my mind, some of the issues that were, and this is probably not a really good time to talk about this, but um, with regards to interest rates and dealing with interest rates and the formation of the Federal Reserve Board, precisely to take it out of, to, to, to produce an A, an a-democratic or anti-democratic mechanism uh, to prevent the type of political um, playing with, uh, with interest rates. And um, if you're going to have this coordination across levels, is it possible that the solution, that really getting the best at all levels is going to be impossible as, as a matter of, ne of, of coordinating various levels of government, that, that you need a sort of group of environmental platonic guardians on some kind of, um, uh, some type of national environmental board um, to set these policies. Um, and I just throw that out as playing the other side, um, whether that's, that really is what needed. Uh, I mean, picking up on that and also your earlier questions, I, I would disagree strongly. I think um, it's true that in terms of international agreements, the federal government is the critical fulcrum between local state efforts and international ones. Um, but I think there's an assumption on the part of a lot of environmentalists in this country based on the experiences of the 60s and 70s that to get real environmental legal reforms in place, the key actor is the federal government. And I actually don't think that that's necessarily true anymore in general, and I specifically don't think it's necessarily true with climate change. And that it turns out that if you look at the, the sort of jurisdictional authority, you know, the ruling very important parts of this, land use decisions, zoning decisions, building code decisions, um, large amounts of the overall energy use sort of decision making, they're, they're not federal decisions. And a lot can be done at the local and municipal county level 
already, and a lot has been done, and a lot of that has been done not by saying, you know, whipping the citizenry and saying you've got to shape up. It's been done by saying these are things that will improve the quality of life in our city and make it more livable, and it's and appealing very much to that kind of whatever local culture, lo local feeling, or, or non sort of, it's not so much about sticks, it's about carrots as well. Um, and I, I think that's something we all have to sort of recognize and work with. And the city of Portland, Oregon is the one I know best. And they've, they've done a lot of really amazing things by saying, look, we don't need the federal government to tell us what to do to make the changes. Okay. Just quickly, I do think, though, that there's also a political will problem in, in the in the uh, organization, you know, when, that you suggest, when uh, I was in law school, one of my mentors, uh, Dan Esty, was arguing stri stridently for a global environmental organization to match the global trade organization. I don't think it's, because it, it, it I, I think it was a good idea, um, but I think there are reasons it hasn't happened in the ensuing period of time. And I think similarly, that we are, just like in international law, are, it's not, it's, it's not um, shocking that the most functional and most binding institutions are those that are financially oriented and trade oriented. Similarly, at a domestic level, I think having the political will to actually invest that kind of an authority might be a, a problem. Yeah, and just a follow-up question to build on what Nathan and Hari talked about is in the, I, the phrase that comes to my mind, uh, probably almost 100 years old now, by now, um, uh, this laboratories of experimentation that Brandeis talked about. And the need for an overarching framework, does that possibly squelch um, the development of good policies um, that might come about in various uh, local jurisdictions? Or have we reached a point as a matter of science, and I, this is where I'm truly ignorant um, uh, as, an, as an issue, whether we reach a science where everyone can agree that here are the, pos here are the, po here are the policies that should be adopted in each, each jurisdiction at each level, um, and the idea of experimenting simply um, has is, is gone by the wayside. So yeah. We definitely need more experimenting um, and, and, and leading by example um, and communicating successful stories from local initiatives that will then encourage other places to do similar things. There was a point that I wanted to make earlier, and that is um, when you do look beyond the local level or the municipal level at what kinds of legal changes might facilitate this, a lot of them become dismantling existing federal laws, policies, programs that in fact prevent local and you know, smaller scale regional efforts at improving practices related to this. Dismantling the USDA would, would be an enormous step forward for enabling <laughs> agriculture in a way that was more sensitive to local demands for environmental quality and climate change. Dismantling the laws that funnel vast quantities of money into building and expanding a car based transportation network would also, I mean, there, there, there are policies from the 20th century that gave the federal government power in ways that institutionalized a national scale system for certain sectors of our economy that are completely irrational now in light of climate change and a bunch of other things. Federal policies, I think, can indeed uh, be an impediment to local innovation and experimentation. And I think we absolutely need that. I, I, you know, the, the, uh, there's uh, uh, quite a bit on adaptive management, adaptive policy making, uh, resilience of institutions. I mean, that, well, I think um, a, a, a experimentation and innovation is critical. But let me just share an ex um, experience. I co chaired the uh, Land Use, Transportation, and Urban Forestry Committee of Louisville's um, Climate Change uh, uh, Task Force. So we came up with the Climate Change Action Plan uh, ju and just finished that uh, recently. And, and I want to suggest that, that another role that federal policy plays is not easily sort of characterized as carrots and sticks, but instead disturbances things that create incentives for localities to engage in that because political will was a huge problem. The ten tendency to fragment and for the green infrastructure people and the compact, high density, infill development people to, to start disagreeing with each other, seeing that as a, as a, a, a zero sum game. Um, and the tendency to treat the, the, what had initially been an action plan into just a set of 
policy ideas to consider is tremendous. And, and if you suggest, well, Portland's doing this, okay, in Louisville, that does not play. I mean, you might as well say Lenin suggested doing this, right? I mean, that's, that's I mean, honestly, that's the politics, right? Okay, not that people aren't interested in addressing climate change, but again, it has to match the local culture, and there has to be the potential that local control could be displaced. Not that it's aggressively being directly dis displaced, but that risk helps to motivate people to find solutions at the local level. Thank you. Could, I, could I just add that uh, very briefly, this, this is not a hypothetical discussion. This is actually playing out in the debates over the pending legislation in the form of preemption. Because uh, industry, if you think about it, is, uh, and it makes sense from where they're coming from, is insisting that uh, state level and local initiatives be preempted by federal authority as the price of any legislation. So uh, you can, in fact, write to your members of Congress and express your view on this. Interestingly, the boxer principles tend to suggest that uh, she's not inclined to support preemption. At least that's as far as I could read the one page. Good. Please. That's exactly the question I was going to ask. I mean, we have we have an arsenal of laws that are designed to protect the environment, and we have a climate plan in the state that has a goal. And my question was. Federal government, along the lines of the international, national pullback you talked about, if we set a national goal, <clears throat> does that number one either preempt what our goal was in the state, or if not that, at least set us up for delay, litigation that would, would challenge what we've done, and you know, we said there's the fear of that. So that, that was really just a question about that. Um, what should we expect, expect along those lines? For, meaning, if, if, if we do a lot of work here, of setting state policies, you know, General Assembly's got all kinds of bills right now about this and that goal. To, is that wasted effort if we put something long on top? Says too much. Okay. Not necessarily. I mean, it depends what the law is. Mm -hmm. um, so even if, I mean, my hope is that the federal legislation um, and the agency action um, won't be very preemptive. Um, uh, and, you know, and the fact that the Obama administration, I mean, it's hard to tell, it's hard to read too much significance into them reconsidering the, the Clean Air Act waiver <coughs> for California because that was such a hot button political issue. But it's at least suggestive that they get that they shouldn't be squelching the states that are, that are in the lead and the localities that are in the lead on this issue. <coughs> but I think even if there are preemption provisions built into this legislation or into executive orders, there's still going to be a lot that's not preempted. And that's because we live in a carbon economy. And so, so much, and, you know, and I think uh, Professor Sayers, Sayers got, talk got into this some, that so much of what we do ends up being connected to our emissions, that there are all sorts of decisions, and this has come up with the local land planning things that, that, that a number of people have said as well, um, that there are so many pieces of that that won't actually be covered by the legislation. And so I would say that, there, that, that, that even in worst case scenario where you have preemptive federal legislation, a lot of state initiatives will still probably be able to go forward because they won't be covered under those preemption um, standards. And by the way, I mean, this, we've been focusing here on international, national, national, state. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting is state, local, and then unpacking the local. Um, I've been obsessed for the last couple of years, as anyone who talks to me about climate change knows, with San Bernardino County. Um, and first of all, what it means to call that county a locality, but you know, it's got cities within it and, and wilderness areas, et cetera. And, um, and, and you know, it was spurred by a lawsuit by California under state California law to start to do environmental, uh, start to do climate planning that it hadn't done before. And one of the things that's really interesting is if you get outside the actual settlement agreement and the specifics of um, you know, they have a consultant designing sort of how they're going to monitor emissions, et cetera. But if you actually look at what Green County San Bernardino is now about, which started at around the same time as they settled the lawsuit, it's fascinating. I mean, they have this city initiative going on that they're doing in conjunction with Riverside County. Um, and some of the things that are in the city initiative aren't cities after all, but are water boards or, um, you know, an army base. And, you know, and so it's, it's very complicated, I think, thinking about what these things are. But, when, but, but in fact, you know, that I think we have to think beyond just the federal state relationship, but also the state and local relationships and also the county and city and, and what all of that is as well. I was, if I can just follow up on that just to, to highlight a, a, 
come back to another point that I do think with San Bernardino County, one of the critical aspects of that is the role of the California Environmental Quality Act and the role that environmental impact analysis plays in California. Um, and, and again, I could just bring in another experience. I was on the Planning Commission in the city of Anaheim and, and chaired that body in where we had to deal with CEQA and um, in that kind of analysis. And it having to do it vastly improves the quality of analysis in comparison to, uh, say, for example, Louisville, which I'm not, not being critical, but it, it's, a, it's a much uh, more um, limited analysis and a much more limited awareness. Yeah. A quick question to follow up on on, um, on this discussion, and maybe with, with uh, Professor Osofsky as, as, as the point person. We talk about the state local level. I, I, one thing that I haven't heard a lot about, and again, it may be my, my lack of knowledge on this particular issue, is local, local on an international level. And I think of, for example, where I grew up in San Diego, there was an ongoing issue about uh, pollution with regards to its twin city of Tijuana. Um, and the notion of preemption on a federal level or preemption on a state level came into play um, with regards to what San Diego as a county and a city could do in relation to the uh, city of Tijuana. And I'm sure you could do that right across the, the entire border um, of the U.S.-Mexico border as well as probably across the Canadian border. Um, what, what kind of issues, what, what, how would you resolve those issues? Would you empower the cities to be able to do the type of, 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 of agreements um, that are usually done only at the international level um, since the particular individuals and communities that are directly affected um, are those um, uh, directly on that border. Yeah, this is a, I mean, so first of all, there's an international coalition of localities working on climate change. There's also a national coalition. One of the most fun uh, little projects they've done the last couple of years was comparing Portland to Tulsa, for example, um, with uh, my, my colleague Janet Lovett. Um, but, you know, so, so, so there's, there are a lot of embedded questions in that. So one is, a bunch of cities decide that they're going to follow the Kyoto Protocol. Um, they're not, of course, bound by the Kyoto Protocol because they can't be part of the Kyoto Protocol. And they're actually joining the Kyoto Protocol as a matter of local law, which is why it doesn't actually get preempted in any sort of way under the way we make treaties. Um, but they're also not bound um, in any meaningful way except in the agreement that they've created. Um, then you get the question of, okay, so these cities are doing this. How, do you, how does that match up to the international negotiations which is going on? Well, the answer is very little. Um, you know, one of the, you know, uh, uh, Gavin Newsom, the mayor of San Francisco, was saying, you know, I mean, he has no voice in international negotiations over climate change, right? Um, the only way he could have a voice is either if he got added to the U.S. delegation, in which case he'd be representing the United States, not the city of San Francisco, or through some of these sort of stakeholder conversations. Um, which had no real formal ability to impact the negotiations. What do you do about that? I don't know the answer because, you know, obviously one could, could radically contemplate redoing the treaty process, but that's not going to happen. Um, and no one's really going to realistically talk about doing treaties completely differently without nation states signing on to them. But I think, I mean, and this is where I think this diagonal stuff can come in, is, is I think we do need to think about, okay, even if we don't want San Francisco to be party to our climate treaties, how do we deal with these coalitions of cities in a more meaningful way in the, in the process of the negotiations and in the substantive results that come out of them? Well, and just to follow up, the, uh, going back to legal pluralism and local experimentation, a number of years ago, uh, the public health authorities of the city of El Paso and Ciudad Juarez wanted to cooperate on public health issues related to air quality in the area, and they couldn't get the governments of the United States or Mexico to, to come together to do it. So they just did it anyway. They just said, okay, well, yes, there might be a preemption argument, but the need is so great that we're just gonna go ahead and reach an agreement between our two cities and, and cooperate. And you know, as far as I know, it just, you know, it just continued. I mean, nobody said anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, Berkeley is a wonderful place for this kind of thing, symbolic city level initiatives and but I mean there are things you can concretely do at that scale that we passed a measure and the city is now putting together a way in which they can lend homeowners the money to install solar systems and then they will get the homeowners to pay it back by building it into their property tax bill over the next 30 years so sort of sidestepping that issue of the ups, upfront well confronting and dealing with the issue of upfront costs um, but on the other hand I mean that was done in the same election in which we voted to impeach 
bush, right? Which we had no standing to do. It was just a purely like, <laughs> this is this is what we feel like doing, and um, we've got. We've got city level targets of 80% reductions by 2050 um, that who knows if we'll make and there's nobody but ourselves can penalize us if we fail. Um, but it, it does go a long way to generating a, a kind of sense at the community scale that these things matter. I think I just briefly add as a former State Department official, the, uh, the, the Constitution absolutely prohibits states and municipalities from conducting foreign relations. But um, that having been said, the practical reality is it is oftentimes very open texture. There's almost no law on this question, um, number one. And number two, uh, because of the political legitimacy that comes from the state and municipal initiatives, um, I think the feds are very reluctant to intervene unless it's absolutely necessary. So, I mean, if anybody's so, for instance, there have been a, a, agreements between, quote unquote, agreements between states and Canadian provinces and, and uh, states and their counterparts across the Mexican border. So long as they're not binding, I doubt that you're going to see any difficulty in practice with the State Department. Uh, it is, it should be possible, I've never done this, but to come up with a grid as to what kinds of things actually do provoke uh, affirmative intervention. For instance, one classic example was that the uh, the then Soviets had a compound on Long Island where the locals kept zone, trying to zone them out. And the State Department did interfere in that one because this was abuse of local power in a way that was harming a foreign state. But I mean, if, if it's just cooperative and, and uh, friendly, and you're unlikely to see the State Department uh, intervene, I think. One well, last quick point uh, that, that no one, I think, has, has said yet on all of this is remember that global urbanization is a huge um, factor in all of this, right? Um, I was just at a conference where Lisa Pruitt said we, in December, passed the point at which more than 50% of the world, I guess, is now in urban places. Um, and um, that, that has a huge impact on the emissions side because um, uh, in general, urban dwellers tend to have a smaller carbon footprint. And so, you know, Portland, is making its per capita goals even though it's missing its total emissions goals because too many people are moving to Portland. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, but also on the impact adaptation side, it matters a lot because um, as cities continue to grow in potential disaster zones, um, it, it sort of has a lot of implications for the policy making around impacts and adaptation. Um, we've come to the end of, our, of this panel. Uh, would you please help me thanking all of our panelists for their great <laughs> Just a reminder, I believe uh, Professor Salvi said there is a picture to be taken um, immediately, and then at 1.45, the symposium continues with the third panel, Greening Energy Policy. Uh, everyone have a great day. So if we can all who need to be in the picture just follow our photographer that way, that would be great. Thanks.